Well, I'm so glad you can join me as we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount. So far, we've looked at the Beatitudes and Jesus telling his disciples to be the salt and the light of the earth and uh, that he had come to fulfill the law, not to replace the law. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue by looking at Jesus' teachings about what it means to commit murder, what it means to be lustful, and how we should be treating divorce as Christians in the church. And we'll be doing that by looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 32. Now, I'd encourage you before we begin our study tonight to go ahead and, uh, uh, and to, to share this video with other people. And uh, it's a great way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, with others. Let's go ahead and start with the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for all the gifts that you have given us. We thank you that even though we sin in so many different ways, that you are our God, that you are gracious, that you are merciful, and that you forgive us when we come and we lay our sins before you. Be with us as we study our, your word tonight, that we may grow in faith, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, before we do get into our study for tonight, I, I do want to let you know we did get a question last week about, uh, uh, about the study that we did from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. The question was asked that if Jesus was telling the disciples that they are the salt, why would Jesus tell them that if they lose their saltiness, they can't be made salty again? Well, the, the point of this, of what Jesus is saying, is simply this, uh, that if someone falls away from the faith, if they are already people who have believed in Jesus and trusted in Jesus, and they fall away from belief in him, then it would have been worse for them if they had never done that. And that if you have experienced the grace and mercy of God and truly reject God, it, you can't be made salty again. And this is not just Jesus that says this, even though obviously Jesus saying this is the most important thing. It's also said in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, where Peter writes, uh, If indeed they have escaped the corruption of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, only to be entangled and overcome by it again, their final condition is worse than it was at first. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it, and then to turn away from the holy commandment passed on to them. So the point of what Jesus is saying here is that the I guess it's that you can you can reject the gift that God has given you after having received it. You can reject God completely. And I'm not talking about struggling with faith. I'm not even taking talking about like the idea that sometimes we can wander through a wilderness where there's doubt. We would all have times of free doubt. But it is that flat rejection of God, that flat rejection of Jesus. If you have known Jesus, if you have known his grace, known his mercy, known his forgiveness, and then you say, screw you, God, I don't want it, I'm good without it, you're a, you're, you're a liar, you're a fool, and I don't believe in Jesus whatsoever. If you say something like that, that is, that is basically saying, I don't want what God, what I know God has already given me. I don't want forgiveness. I don't want life. I don't want salvation. And really what that is, that is a blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, which is also the one unforgivable sin that Jesus talks about. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not, uh, is not saying something bad about the Holy Spirit, even though why would you say that if you're a believer? But it is a rejection of the Spirit and the gift of faith that that is ours. And if you have that gift and you reject it, then you have committed an unforgivable sin. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you truly believe and then you wander away, how can you believe again? Because you've known the truth and then you've rejected the truth. That's, that's what Jesus is saying here. I hope that makes sense. Uh, maybe you don't agree with my interpretation of that or, or with how, what Peter says in, in 2 Peter 2, uh, uh, but... But that is, that is what we believe, is, what I believe as a church, that's how I interpret it, and that's generally what we believe as a church body as well. But I hope, I hope that answers the questions. If it didn't, please reach out to me, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer it maybe a little bit better than that. Uh, if you do have any questions that come up in our study for tonight, I do encourage you to reach out to me, and I will do my best to answer those first thing next week. But with that, we're going to go ahead and get into our text for tonight. So uh, we are now looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 32. And what we're looking at today is really separated into two sections, uh, anger and lust. Uh, but, but what Jesus is really talking about, he's expounding on the fifth and the sixth commandments. It's important for us to remember what we read last week in verses 17 through 20, when Jesus is saying, I have not come to replace the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. 
Jesus now is going to be teaching his disciples what the law actually means and not just what they've been taught, but the fullness of it, the fullness of what it means. Now, the, 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 the people of Israel had been taught the truth of the law, but not in its entirety. I'm going to teach it in its fullness. So with that, let's go ahead and get into our text. Let's start off by reading uh, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, where Jesus says, you have heard, you have, uh, really quick, last thing before I do read this. Uh, important for us to remember, once again, the audience that Jesus is talking to, he is talking to his disciples. He's talking to people who believe in him and follow him. In that respect, he's talking to us who are his followers and his believers today as well. So let's, now, with that being said, let's read this. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, so Jesus starts this, this teaching about murder and anger. The fifth commandment. The fifth commandment, obviously, is Jesus, uh, when God gave the commandment to the people of Israel, and he said, you shall not murder. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So Jesus is talking about what of Israel are being taught by the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders who completely depended upon for their instruction in the faith and the law of God. They had seen that that commandment, which was a true commandment. Jesus, Jesus does not contradict this commandment. If you murder someone, you you are you shall not murder anyone. God, God, that is a commandment of God's in the book of Exodus. You shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. This, what he's doing here is he's essentially saying, all you heard about murder was the civil impact and punishment from the teachers of the law and the scribes. But you do not hear a word about God and what by this commandment he requires of the heart. A word about the lust or passions that lead to actual murder, and though they may not produce murder, and even though they may not produce murder, are just as wicked as murder. So Jesus is telling the people here, what you've heard is correct, you shall not murder. And of course you'll be liable to the civil court. So that when he says whoever murders will be liable to judgment, he's talking very specifically here in the civil courts. Whoever murders will be murders will be liable to the justice system of Israel at the time. Is is really getting at is he's going the rest of the, this passage is really about him saying, murder murder, of course, is evil. Just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to go kill someone, just for fun. Now, I, granted, there may be some sociopaths and psychopaths out there that have done that in the world. There are people who are just evil, and they're, they're so messed up that they actually may do that for fun. But by and large, by and large, people who do not have horrible mental... Actually, I'll go ahead and say this. People who do not have horrible mental conditions that would lead them to kill people for fun. They don't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to murder someone. Just for fun. They don't do that. There's something that rises in their hearts that leads that. There's things that, that bring them to that point of committing murder. And those things are anger, hatred, lusts, passions. Those things are what lead to murder. So Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is, it's not just the physical action of murder that separates you from God. It's the heart condition that leads you to want to kill someone. And he says this, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So this is important here, right here. Jesus is expounding upon the teaching of Moses, giving it its fullest meaning. And, uh, uh, and also here, he is making it very clear that uh, uh, he is the one with authority. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were teaching what they had been taught. Jesus is teaching with authority because he... Father and the Spirit were the ones who actually gave this command. So Jesus is able to speak to the fullness of what was intended with this command. And it's not just the act of murder, it's the heart condition that leads to murder. And whoever 
is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Here Jesus is making it clear it's not liable just to judgment here in this world. As a matter of fact, you can't be liable to judgment here in this world for just hating your brother. You can't be thrown in prison for the thoughts of your heart that no one else can discern. But there can be eternal judgment because God sees the heart. He sees the motivation. We can't hide those things from God. So when he says here you're liable to judgment, it's something much greater than the judgment that the people would face for murdering someone. The judgment is eternal. And he continues on by saying this. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So Jesus continues on here and says basically, uh, it's it's not just, uh, uh, it's, it's really not just what the physical action is. It's if you are insulting your brother in anger. And and we've all, the thing that's very difficult about this passage is we've all done this. We've all had people in our lives, and, and Jesus is specifically here speaking about the brother. So let's just even remove talking about this with other people. Let's just focus on Jesus talking about us with our fellow believers. All of us have had fellow believers in our lives that infuriate us. All of us have had fellow believers in our lives that we have insulted to their face and behind their back because we're angry about something they've done. All of us have uh, uh, have probably at some point or another called a brother or sister in Christ a fool because we're so filled with anger that in the moment we hate them. We may not hate them forever, but in the moment we hate them. If we've done those things, then we are liable to the hell of fire. done those things were all guilty of condemnation and I'm guessing that all of you who are watching this have done those things before I know I have I am guilty of that I'm guilty of that with my brothers and sisters in Christ I'm guilty with that with people who were not my brothers and sisters in Christ I have looked on anger I have looked in hatred at people in my life before our condition separates me from God as much as any physical act that I can do here in this world. Now, I, I do want to be very clear, there is clearly a difference between murdering someone here in this world and saying an insult to someone here in this world. There are earthly judgments that will be meted out. If you murder someone in this world, you will go to prison, or depending where you live, you may face the death sentence. That is a worthy punishment if you have truly murdered someone in this world. That is not a word, worthy punishment if you have just uttered an insult in this world. But the eternal judgment, the heart condition, that's the issue. And that hatred and that anger and those insults that we give towards other people, those things separate our hearts as much from God as murder would separate our hearts from God. That's the point of what Jesus is saying. So he's, he's calling us as believers to not live in anger, to not live... And then he gives some very specific examples of how we can do that uh, in the remaining verses. So he says in verse 23, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So Jesus gives this example of if you have wronged somebody, if you have wronged brother or sister in Christ, if you have wronged someone else and you are in the act of worship and you remember that wrong, leave what you are doing and go and confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. Seek reconciliation. Now this may seem extreme, but any sin that is lying in our conscience, uh, but, but the idea that your brother may have something uh, excuse me, I, I lost my spot here. But the, uh, the first priority of the worshiper is to seek reconciliation with an offended believer. God looks at the heart and no act of worship is acceptable to him which comes from a heart that is guilty of unconfessed wrong to another. That's why God actually says, leave it behind. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal because the, the religious leaders of the day would have taught, no, you, 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 you complete your sacrifice. You complete your act of worship. Jesus is saying that... Uh, uh, it, it, the object of worship is not the sacrifice. The object of worship is a broken and contrite heart. And the way that we 
exercise that, the way that we actually live that out is when we have sinned against someone to go to them and to ask for forgiveness. And so that's why it's important for us in our lives to seek reconciliation with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. He gives another example by a parable in verses 25 and 26 when he says, Come to Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, never get out until you have paid the last penny. This gives this little parable here, and he's talking really about a debtor uh, and how debtors would be dealt with in Israel at that time. And... Uh, uh, here Jesus is speaking to the one who owes the debt, and he's saying the sensible thing for that person who owes the debt to do is to come to a settlement with the person before he goes to court. Uh, because if not, then who knows what will happen. The judge, if, if you actually owe the debt, if you know you've done wrong and you owe the debt, then you will get your punishment, unless you can make a settlement and come to reconciliation with your brother. It's a saying here, unless you... Uh, if you have sinned against your brother, you should seek to reconcile with him. Because, because, if, if you, if, if you will go, in the same way the judge will punish the person who has wronged the other, so God will punish you if you have wronged a brother and remained in unrepentance towards them. So Jesus' point is, if you have sinned, if you have sinned against your brother, Settle it. Go and seek reconciliation. And if you bring a repentant heart to them and ask for forgiveness and they refuse to give it, then at that point, at that point, their sin is their responsibility. The burden's been put on them to forgive you. And they should seek to do that. So what Jesus is saying here in these verses about anger is that anger is anger and hatred is what leads to murder is the culmination of a sinful heart that is already present, that has already committed murder in their own hearts. And guilty of this, instead of continuing on in that guilt, we should seek reconciliation. And, and the more we come to know God, and the more we come to know Christ, the more we come to experience His love and His mercy in our lives, the more we are transformed to be able to live a life where we don't live in anger and hatred to someone else. So that's the first part of this, this fifth commandment uh, that Jesus is teaching on here. But then he also goes into the sixth commandment, and he talks about lust and adultery. So this is what he says, verses 27 through 32. We'll do this, and then that'll be it for tonight. Verses 27 32, Jesus says this. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So, a lot going on here. And these two things are tied together. I think sometimes we separate them, and we make the divorce separate from the lust, but, but these are tied together, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a moment, because both these things are dealing with the Sixth Commandment. So, he starts off by saying, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Once again, this teaching has been present from the... Uh, from the time of Moses and the book of Exodus, and that's what is being taught by the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The same thing that we talked about with the fifth commandment. But here Jesus expounds upon this and says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the lustful intent here, that idea behind that is, is that it is a, a burning sexual desire. So whoever looks at a woman with a burning sexual desire that person has already committed lust, uh, adultery with her in his heart. So this is important for us to understand. This is not the same thing as somebody seeing a, a pretty girl or a, a woman seeing a pretty man and saying, oh, they're beautiful. That's a beautiful person. It's not lust. You can, you can acknowledge the beauty of another person without having lustful, sexual, burning desire to be with them. But when that lustful 
burning sexual desire becomes present, the heart already committed adultery. So that's that's why things like looking at pornography. I mean, that that's not just admiring the beauty of someone else. Looking at pornography is lustful. So when you look at pornography, that is committing adultery already in your heart. That's just a reality. Uh, when you see a pretty girl down the street and you say that you, man, I do anything to be with her, that kind of thing. That's already committing. That is committing adultery because the lustful intent is there. And even the joking, like I, I've heard people joke around about these kind of things before, like the, uh, well, if you, we, you know, my, my husband and wife have this deal that if there was one person that we could actually have sex with, then, 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 then we'd give a pass to that person. Well, that's committing adultery already in your heart. To admire the beauty of someone, to even acknowledge the beauty of someone, and to admire the beauty of someone, it's not okay to have that sexual burning desire to be with them. And uh, uh, and this should also be understood that it's not just talking about married men, but any man who w looks on a woman with burning sexual desire who is not his wife. And this is something important for us to understand. I think we've gotten this idea today that as long as you're not married, it's okay to have sex with whoever you want. That's not the idea here. Uh, uh, Jesus has, in, the gift of sex is an amazing gift that God has given to humanity. But it is given for men and women in the context of marriage. And where sex is taking place out of marriage and where lustful intent is taking place out of marriage, that their adultery is happening. And so if somebody looks at a woman lustfully who is not his wife, they have already committed adultery. If you look at your wife, if you are married and you look at your wife lustfully, that, that's actually, that's okay. That's good. That's actually not okay. That's good. You should have that burning sexual desire for your wife, right? But if it's someone not your wife at any place, or women, if it's someone not your husband in any way, you're already commi committed adultery in your heart. Now, Jesus continues on in verse 29 and says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than the, that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, this is interesting here. It's clearly hyperbolic. Jesus is clearly not saying, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. But what he's really doing is he's calling out people who use, uh, uh, who use excuses to pardon their sinful desire. So, for instance, you know, somebody says something along the lines of, you know, I don't want to look lustfully at someone. I don't want to look at, I don't want to look at pornography, but, you know, I can't help it. I have eyes. I'm just a man. I have eyes, right? How can I not see it? What you're doing there is you're blaming your eyes. Or everyone does it. What you're doing there is saying, well, everyone sins. So it's a, but what the real issue is, is your heart. It's, and Jesus' point is not, your eye is not causing you to sin. Your hand is not causing you to sin. Your heart is the source of your sin. But hey, if you're going to say that it's all about your eye and what you see, then pluck it out. Because if it's just about your eye, then pluck it out, you'll be fine. This is not actually saying to dismember yourself. He's calling out the excuse making that so often we do as human beings. It's not your eye that is causing you to sin. It is your sinful heart that is causing you to sin. Uh, and so Jesus is saying, your, your heart needs to be changed. Through the mercy and grace of God, our hearts can be changed. Because we're sinful people living in a sinful world. We're going to look at people lustfully sometimes. In our, we are being transformed by God. The more we are growing in our faith, the less those things will happen. This is, once again, is getting at the same way that murder is not just a physical act. It is the, the heart condition that anger and hatred leads to. In the same way, adultery is not just the act of adultery. It is the heart condition that leads to adultery. Jesus continues on in verse 31 to 32. Where the, and this is where this continues talking about adultery. Okay, this is, It's not about the lustful intent here at this point, but it is talking about adultery when he talks about divorce. And he says this, was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except in the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus is, is the, the people of Israel are being taught at the time by the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, that, uh, 
that they could divorce for basically anything. Deuteronomy 24.1. This is the, the source of this practice for the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 24.1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. So basically, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. But basically what the teaching was, was um, that you could divorce your wife if you found any reason to have displeasure with her. And it's important for us to understand here, the context of the time, only men could divorce women. It wasn't the other way around. Only a husband can divorce their wife. Women had no rights in that respect. Men did at the time of Jesus. But what was being taught was, if you find anything that displeases you and your wife, you can divorce her. And so divorce was very casual. It was done very frequently, and it was done for reasons that were really no reason whatsoever. You could be upset at your wife because she doesn't please you in bed be upset at your wife because she doesn't cook well. You can be upset at your wife just because uh, you did something to make you upset one day. For whatever reason, you're going to divorce her. That was what was being taught. That was what was being done. But Jesus here is saying, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except in the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus is making it very clear here. He's not... He's not excluding divorce. And that's actually important for us to understand. He is not actually excluding divorce, but he is making it clear that's not the intent of divorce. The intent of divorce is not just so you can separate from your spouse whenever you feel like it. There is a time and a place where divorce, unfortunately, may be necessary. But you can't just do it for whatever reason. And so the man who divorces his wife carelessly is, and eventually, essentially what Jesus is saying is the man who divorces his wife carelessly is causing both his wife and her future husband to sin. So, because God had brought, God, we, we are taught in the Old through Jesus as well, that in marriage God brings men and women together and they become one. It is a sacred bond, a sacred unity. Flippantly, Easily separate that is completely wrong. To marry someone after that, have marital relations with them, is violating that covenant you made before God in your first marriage or your previous marriage. So what Jesus is saying here is don't treat marriage so casually. There are times where divorce may be necessary. Jesus actually gives a, a reason right there. So, you know, if someone divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, a, adultery, those kind of things may be a reason for divorce. I'm not going to give a whole litany, but there are other reasons for divorce. If there's abuse taking place, if there's uh, if, if, if there is somebody who has basically left you and is completely abandoned you, there may be a time and a place for that kind of divorce. But but Jesus doesn't give a list of what is where, where divorce can come from or not. But is is that we should be treating marriage more sacredly. A woman who has been divorced carelessly and the man she she remarries, Jesus is saying, does not they do not commit adultery. But they're having something committed against them. They are being made into adulterers by the action of the person who divorced for no reason. It is thus that Jesus unfolds to his Jewish hearers in the Jewish environment in which they live the vicious effects upon the innocent when the sixth commandment is transgressed by the rending of the marriage tie. So this is very important for us to remember. God has brought people together in marriage for a reason. We are to treat the marriage bread as sacred and holy, and we are to not seek divorce for flippant and ridiculous reasons. Go ahead and say it. There's no such thing as a no-fault divorce. If there's a no-fault divorce, you are committing adultery. Because at that point, you're basically saying, you know what, I don't really, this. I don't, I don't like this person anymore, and so, hey, you know what, marriage is not a big deal, we'll just cut it out. That's not the way it works. And that's what Jesus is saying here. 
marriage is sacred. Marriage is holy. And yes, there may be a point where divorce needs to happen. But we should not treat it so casually as we do in our society today and how the people of Israel were treating in their society at that day. Sex is an incredible gift from God, which is to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage. And marriage is something to be held as sacred and holy. We do all we can to preserve that. Understanding that sometimes there may be no other choice than to get divorced, but that's not something that is good or God-pleasing. But it's something that we may have to deal with in a reality in this world that we live in that's broken. That's where we're going to wrap up tonight. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I hope this made some sense, and I hope maybe you have a deeper understanding of some of the fifth and sixth commandment as well as we try to seek to follow God as his children and his kingdom. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word and for your love for us. We thank you for the gift of life and the gift of marriage. We pray, God, that we would not live in anger or hatred towards others, that we would not look lustfully at others, that we would seek to, to honor our husbands or our wives in all that we do and say. Guide us, protect us, watch over us, and be with us as we go about our week. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a great night.